Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Gospel passage takes us back to the night in which Jesus is betrayed. In John's Gospel, Jesus has just broken bread with his disciples. Jesus, in an act of servant leadership, has just washed his disciples' feet. He has talked at great length and demonstrated through his own deeds what it means to love God and to love one another. He now talks about the interconnectedness we have with each other through faith. So as the meal ends, Jesus begins to pray. In fact, all of chapter 17 is a prayer. In those opening verses, Jesus begins his prayer with prayers for himself as he approaches those events that will lead to his death on a cross. He then turns to his followers and he prays for their continued well-being. In closing, Jesus prays for the whole church. Our passage today focuses on that middle portion of the prayer where Jesus offers a prayer for his followers. This is a powerful gospel passage. Through these words, Jesus prays. Now we often hear that prayer is very important in Jesus' life and his ministry. Jesus walked up the mountain to pray. He paused in the garden to pray. He even withdrew to a deserted area to pray. And now in this passage, Jesus is with his beloved followers in that upper room, and he prays. Prayer has been so integral into Jesus' life and ministry that he even teaches his own disciples how to pray. In prayer, I think Jesus teaches us how to speak and to talk with God the Father. As I said, the entire chapter is devoted to prayer. And by the choice of verbs, this isn't just a prayer for those followers. This is a prayer for Jesus' followers, past, present, and future. This means that Jesus is praying for us as well. That's powerful. Jesus prays for us. He prays for our protection. He prays for our well-being. He prays for our call to share the good news of God with the world. That's powerful. Now, if I was in your congregation today, I might ask for a show of hands. I might ask, how many of you pray? Well, just by virtue of being together today, I can guarantee that there will be at least one prayer. So yes, we pray. I might ask, how many of you believe in the power of prayer? And I'm sure there would be several who raise their hands in the affirmative. Now I can only speak for myself, but through my own experiences, I have found prayer to be a powerful connection with God. Some of you know that my husband suffered from brain cancer for over 20 years. Those years were filled with prayers and pleas to God for healing. Early on, as time progressed, I grew in my prayer life. I not only prayed for healing, but I prayed for coping skills. I prayed for wisdom and guidance. I prayed for the medical teams, the technologies, and the medications. I prayed for all those whom we met on any given appointment day. When Duane was first diagnosed, of course, we were shell-shocked. How could you not be? And we prayed. As those opening days unfolded, it became clear to both of us that God was directing us to seek a second opinion. That decision was transformational, and it was life-giving for Duane. The Fargo doctor lined things up and got us in at Mayo, where, just by chance, one of the world's leading doctors in the diagnosis and, and treatment of brain tumors happened to be visiting and training the doctors at Mayo on a new technique in how to diagnose brain tumors. 
This technique was used on Duane to more carefully diagnose his condition. Prayer is powerful and God's presence was revealed to be at work. During one of Brain's, Duane's surgeries on his brain, we prayed for the skilled surgeon and we prayed for the staff. We prayed for God's healing touch. And after many hours of surgery, the doctor came out to talk to us. I noticed that he couldn't quite look up at us as he was telling us about the surgery. I kind of had a sense that the results were not going to be so great, at least less than stellar. The surgeon began by talking about all the good things that had happened during the surgery. And then he got to that one tiny little word, but. But I have to tell you, Duane suffered a stroke on the operating table. He can't move his fingers or his toes. We'll just have to see what time will tell. The doctor returned to the operating room and we were devastated. We knew there was risk in the surgery, but this was bigger than what we had anticipated. But then about an hour later, the doctor came back and he was practically running down the hall to the waiting room. He burst into the waiting room and he said, Dwayne can move his fingers and his toes. This is great news and we were elated. God's presence was at work. Several days later, we learned more about Dwayne's surgery. Yes, Dwayne had had a stroke, but in the doctor's own words, he said, you know, I would never wish a stroke on anyone. They're devastating. But in your particular case, it was fortunate. The blood clot that had caused the stroke actually had lodged at the base of the tumor and thereby it was blocking the blood supply to the tumor. In other words, the tumor was being deprived of food. God's presence was at work, even through a blood clot. Now I try not to second guess God's response to prayer. Were they able to get the whole tumor out? No, we knew that going in. Did the tumor go away? No, but that doesn't mean that God wasn't present. That doesn't mean that God's caring and healing present wasn't at work, bringing new life and new opportunity. Like Jesus, I believe that prayer is powerful. It is a direct connection to a loving God, a God who is living and acting and bringing new life all the time. Prayers are not just some lofty sort of appeal that gets stashed away up in heaven. I don't believe that prayer is like a vending machine, you know, like insert prayer, make your selection, and out pops your anticipated result. I don't believe our relationship to God is transactional. But I do believe that prayer is about relationship. It's about dwelling in the presence of God. It's about laying out our concerns and then leaving things in God's hands. For God will handle the situation. God promises to hear our prayers. God will respond. Maybe not in the way that we anticipate, but I guarantee that God is at work. I also believe that prayer is not just our opportunity to talk to God. I also believe that it is God's opportunity to communicate with us, to respond in some amazing and life-giving way. More often than not, God's response to our prayers may involve our own participation. Throughout this season of Easter, we have focused on our connection and our relationship to our brothers and sisters in India. Several weeks back, Pastor Andrew explored the idea of containment. In fact, he came to the conclusion that God cannot be contained not by force, not by violence, 
not by the cross or the grave, a heavy stone or even a locked door. God cannot be contained. There's nothing in this world that can contain or restrain the love and work of God in Christ Jesus. Pastor Dave talked about our connections through food and flood. We know what it is like to be a breadbasket for the world. We also know the devastating effects of seasonal flooding. And although we live thousands of miles apart, we have more in common with one another than we do in our differences. Today, Jesus reveals the power of prayer. Not only does he pray for us, but his prayer reveals his fervent desire for communal relationship. He emphasizes this interconnectedness that we have with one another through the Father. In a day and age of division, there is no us versus them. For in God's world, there is only we. I once had a confirmation student tell me that God has a habit of upending us. God transforms us from me, M E, and upends us to we. W-E, just flip the word upside down, me to we. In this three-part sermon series, we have turned our attention to our brothers and sisters in India. Climate change has strengthened the annual monsoon season, leaving a devastating path of flooding in its aftermath. The progression of COVID is not only challenging, but it too is devastating. Former Bishop Larry Wolrabi shared some words this past week from our friends in India. Pata writes, things are moving from bad to worse. Every day we find somebody breathing their last. Pastors, their spouses, gospel workers and evangelists are taken away. Of late, even vaccination has become a rare commodity, and people are suffering a lot. The churches are locked, so no worship in church buildings. No worship means no offerings. No offerings means no salaries, especially for the pastors in rural areas. The pandemic is snatching away young people all around us, and the area is identified as a red zone. Our brothers and sisters in India seek our prayers. At the office this week, Chris was retelling about a phone conversation she had with someone. They were heartbroken about the events happening at our southern border. They had seen the pain and the suffering of so many splashed across their TV screen. They could understand a parent's desperate desire to seek safety, shelter, and opportunity for their children, even if it meant at the expense of separation. The caller exclaimed, I'm just tired of just praying. I want to do something. I want to do something for those who are suffering. I got to tell you, prayer often motivates us to action. That's kind of part of God's plan. For our brothers and sisters in India, there are things that we can do. Next to prayer, probably one of the easiest things that we can do is to donate our financial resources. Now, I know this year has been hard on many. And I know also that we have been abundantly blessed. So there is opportunity for us to give. In one of Jesus' teaching parables, He makes this comment. He says, from everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. Now that sounds like a tall order, but I do think it is a recognition of our blessedness. As we live out God's love for the world, we respond to those in need. We respond by praying, and we can respond by giving. 
Out of love, we are called to recognize our interconnectedness. We're called to recognize others as brothers and sisters in Christ, children of the same Creator God. So today I invite you to join with me as we offer our prayers and our financial assistance to our brothers and sisters living in India. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, creator of all the world, open our eyes to those around us. Open our hearts to the needs of others. We pray especially this day for our siblings in India. Surround them with your comforting, healing, and steadfast presence. Bind us together in the sacrificial love of your Son, Jesus Christ. May we be one with you in mission and ministry. In your name we pray. Amen.